Okay, we are into Chapter 6. This is on growth and nutrition, media, how to grow them, variables, things like that. Big chapter. Um, okay, so let's start off with things organisms need. By the way, this applies to bacteria as well as humans. Two things needed by all organisms. Carbon and energy. You gotta have carbon to make organic compounds, proteins, nucleic acids, blah blah blah. There are two places that carbon can come from. It can come from carbon dioxide or it can come from something like glucose or an amino acid, or a fat. Okay, so which do humans do? Well, we don't use carbon dioxide, we make CO2. We obviously get our carbon from preformed organic compounds. When you grow bacteria in the laboratory, there's organic compounds of various types, sugars, amino acids, proteins, fats, in the media, and the bacteria as they grow are using those organic compounds. They are getting energy from them, but they also, as they get broken down, they use the carbon to make other organic compounds they need. So when you're growing E. coli in the lab on an auger plate, it fits into this same scenario, preformed organic compounds. Organisms that fit this scenario are called heterotrophs. E. coli, for example, is heterotrophic. Your cells are heterotrophic. Now, on the other hand, photosynthetic organisms use the carbon from CO2 and they turn it into glucose and other organic compounds. They are called autotrophic. So autotrophs get their carbon from CO2 and heterotrophs get their carbon from organic compounds. Now I mentioned that the other thing that's needed is energy. So there are two sources for energy. You get your energy from light, could be sunlight, could be an incandescent light, fluorescent light, whatever. Or you get your energy from utilizing chemicals and putting these chemicals through oxidation reduction reactions, like in cell respiration. Now obviously, we fit the second scenario we use chemicals, our cells. That was cell respiration and fermentation and all of that. So we are chemotrophic. Again, all the bacteria we use in the lab are chemotrophic because they are utilizing organic compounds in the media, sending those compounds through oxidation reduction reactions and getting their energy to grow, to reproduce. Now, Chemotrophs can fall in, into two categories. There are the ones that use organic compounds in their oxidation reduction reactions. They're called chemoorganotrophs. We are obviously in that category, as well as E. coli. And then there are the organisms that use inorganic compounds uh, as the source for their oxidation reduction reactions, and they are chemolithotrophs. So what kind of organic compounds could be used? Well, again, all the ones named previously, glucose uh, would be um, the obvious thing, fats, any number of things, amino acids. Um, this glucose is obviously oxidized to carbon dioxide by us, by E. coli. But in the case of a chemolithotroph, they might use something like hydrogen sulfide and oxidize it to a sulfur compound. Or they might use a nitrogen compound like nitrite and oxidize it. So those are some things that chemolithotrophs might use. Now, obviously there are the guys that use light for energy 
And again, we're back to the photosynthesizers. And organisms that do that are called phototrophs. So photo, light, chemo, energy from chemicals. Now, let me back up and go back to the previous shot, which was sources of carbon. So you got two sources of carbon. You got two sources of energy. All organisms have to have one of both. So if you mix and match these four categories, you pull a carbon source from each, you pull a, a uh, energy source from each, what you end up with are four categories. Here they are. So energy sources at the top. Again, you've got two columns. You've got the ones that are using uh, light for their energy. Those are phototrophic. Ones that are using chemicals for their energy, chemotrophic. Then look at the rows. Go over to the far left. You see carbon source. The ones that get their carbon from CO2, the ones that get their carbons from organic compounds. You see four categories there. These are called the nutritional types of organisms. Photoautotrophs, they're getting their energy from light. They're getting their carbon from CO2. Look at chemoheterotrophs. Obviously, we're in that category. In fact, all the bacteria we use in lab are in that category. They use organic compounds for their oxidation reduction reactions. They are getting their carbon from the same organic compounds, chemoheterotrophic. Most of the organisms you ever even contact are in the chemoheterotroph group. And all animals are in there. And of course, all plants are up in the photoautotroph group. But if you look at examples in each of the four groups, you'll see something mm, common in all four groups, and that is bacteria. There are, there are different bacteria in each of the four groups. The point to be made here is that bacteria are more metabolically diverse than any other organisms. Animals only fit in the chemoheterotrophic group. They don't fit into photoautotrophic, photoheterotrophic, chemoautotrophic. Plants fit into the photoautotrophic group. But bacteria, different groups of bacteria, fit into all four categories. And the other point to be made here is that these four groups all live in uh, environments, and they interact with each other. So look at the uh, guys at the top, the autotrophs, or the lithotrophs, if you want to call them, same thing. Um, they put uh, organic materials uh, back into water, into soil, which are necessary by the, for the heterotrophs to grow. Um, OK, so this is a kind of a busy shot. But um, I hope it, you gain something out of it. OK, so look at this category right here, the chemoorganotrophs right here. They're using an organic compound, like a glucose. They oxidize it to CO2. That's what you see here. Um, these guys, th this is cell respiration, as you already know. Remember that um, oxygen can be the final electron acceptor, or if there's no oxygen there, some organisms can use alternate electron acceptors. That's anaerobic respiration. OK, so that's you already know that. Your cells do that. Now, look at this group down here, chemolithotrophs. They are using inorganic things, like I mentioned hydrogen sulfide. They use a sulfur compound, for example, like hydrogen sulfide. They oxidize it to sulfur. You see that right there. Or they could use something else. They can use, a, a lot of times, they use uh, nitrogen compounds, like a nitrite. Um, look at the guys down here. And you have two categories here. You've got the photoautotrophs over here. They are like the photoheterotrophs, using light to get ATP, 
The photoautotrophs are using CO2. The photoheterotrophs are using organic compounds to get their carbon. Okay, so let's look at some variables. Whoops, I think that just jumped. No, oh, guess not. Okay, oxygen requirements. Remember, oxygen is need needed in aerobic respiration at the end of the electron transport chain. All right, so different categories that we've got of organisms based on their oxygen. Let's start with something that you know. Um, and that is our cells. Our cells, most of our cells, are obligate aerobic. That is, they are obligated to have oxygen. And if they do not, they die. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, muscle cells, for short periods of time, can, uh, at least skeletal muscle, can uh, do uh, a fermentation without oxygen. But that's, the rest of your cells can't. Many bacteria are obligate aerobes. So if you look at the picture over here, uh, let's see, let me go back here. All right. So if you look at where the growth is, okay, so you've got tubes of broth that's in blue. The bacteria are all growing up here at the very top. Okay, these are just little pop tops right here on the top. Oxygen, by the way, can get in underneath these caps and into the tubes. The those pop cups pop caps do not keep oxygen out. So the growth of the organisms is all up here. These are obligate aerobes, have to have oxygen. You get As you get further down into the media here, there's less oxygen. You get down here at the bottom, there's no oxygen. Notice that the bacteria are not growing down here at the bottom. There's not enough oxygen to sustain them. Okay, let's jump to the other guys that are on the, at the other spectrum, obligate anaerobes. So look at this group. The strict anaerobes are obligate anaerobes. They are obligated to grow without oxygen. Look where they're growing. They like it way down here where there is no oxygen. They will not grow up here because there's a little bit of oxygen and that can kill them. Okay, obligate anaerobes. All right, then we've got the guys that can take it or leave it. If they have it, they would rather use it. If they don't have it, they can live without it. Facultative anaerobes. You've got them right here in the second tube. Where are they growing the best? They're growing up here where there's oxygen. But they're growing down here at the bottom too without oxygen. They just don't like it as well. Again, they prefer to use oxygen. If they don't have it, they grow without it. Okay, now, don't confuse facultative anaerobes with aerotolerance. Okay, so here's aerotolerance. Term tells you exactly what they are. They tolerate oxygen. They don't use it. They ignore it. So in this tube, they are growing equally well everywhere. They are not growing better in oxygen because as far as they're concerned, there is no oxygen and they don't care. They don't know what oxygen is. Then last, we've got the microaerophilics, which literally means likes a small, amount of air. Look at these guys right here. Now remember what I said before. You've got the most oxygen up at the top. You've got no oxygen down here at the bottom. And then all in this area you've got um, decreasing amounts of oxygen as you go down the tube. Well look right here. We're a little bit down into the broth. This is less than 20% oxygen. Now remember the atmosphere where we are is about 21% oxygen and up here at the top of the tube is where you'd have about 21% oxygen. Down here you might have 15, 10% oxygen but there are a lot of organisms that would rather have reduced oxygen and that's what the microaerophiles are. Now depending on what you want to grow whether your organism is microaerophilic or it's aerotolerant, you may have to put them in different environments. Um, if you're trying to grow a, an obligate anaerobe, you would not use our incubator from the laboratory because 
That's ambient oxygen concentration. That is, there's a pipe that goes into that incubator, and it's got it's carrying in oxygen, it's carrying in air from the atmosphere from our lab. It's the same concentration of oxygen. So an anaerobic organism, a strict anaerobe, will not grow if you just put a plate of them in there in the incubator. Instead, you might want to put them into an anaerobic jar. We'll be using an anaerobic jar in lab. Now, if you want to grow a, f a uh, microaerophile, you've got to find an environment where there is still oxygen. They have to have oxygen, but they like it best at lower concentrations, like 10%, something like that. Well, this is a candle jar right here. And in a candle jar, notice that there's a candle, and it's on fire. And as it burns, the oxygen is so you okay, so you put the plates in there and you put the candle in there and then you put the lid on it, but there's gonna be twenty percent oxygen in here, correct? Twenty one percent oxygen. As the candle is burning, the concentration of oxygen becomes less than twenty percent. It goes to eighteen, it goes to fifteen, it goes to twelve, it goes to ten. And eventually there is not enough oxygen to sustain this fire, and that's at probably somewhere around, I don't know, ten percent oxygen, and the fire goes out. So this is a microaerophilic environment. That's what you end up with in that jar. Whereas this jar over here is going to be totally anaerobic. All the oxygen is removed from it. Okay, so oxygen toxicity. Uh, there are a lot of uh, intermediates of uh, between water and oxygen that are produced. Many of these are toxic, like superoxide radical, um, peroxide radical, hydroxyl uh, radicals have charges on them. Uh, they have extra electrons, and they tend to attract other um, electrons from other side chains and other molecules. Uh, and can damage um, the chemistry inside of a cell. That's how they work. That's how they uh, can kill. So if you are an anaerobic organism, um, well, let me back up. If you're an organism that is um, making some of these byproducts, like superoxide radical, if you had an enzyme that would break superoxide radical down so that even though you're making it, any of these, um, it gets broken down, you have no problem because your byproducts that could be toxic, you're able to get rid of in the environment. But most of the anaerobes do not have these enzymes and so in the presence of oxygen, they can be damaged as a result of some of these byproducts. Um, I'm going to let you read up on these growth factors, nitri vitamins, uh, nitrogen, all sorts of elements needed, just like your own cells need them. Okay, temperature. Um, you're looking at um, different growth curves. Um, your rate of growth is going up the y-axis and your temperature going that way. And remember that uh, body temperature for a human is right there at about 37. Okay. So in cold temperatures, look at the blue line first. Okay, so your temperature range is pretty much between about 0 and 20, but your optimal range is somewhere around maybe 8 to 15. Now remember, we're talking uh, centigrade here or Celsius. Where would you find these temperatures? Refrigerator freezer, um, ice fields, things like that. Organisms that optimally grow in those temperatures are psychrophiles. Then, let's go up to the heat lovers. Look at the peach colored line over here. Um, they can grow anywhere from uh, about 50 up to maybe 80, 75 is their uh, range of growth generally but they like this the best, and that's somewhere between around uh, 65 to 70 Celsius. Now remember, that's really hot. Um, to convert that, 
120. That's about 160 degrees Fahrenheit up in this range. Um, not any temperature that we would uh, do well at. So these are thermophilic hot springs, vents under the ocean that are releasing hot gases, uh, lava fields, um, compost piles. Compost piles are around 70 degrees. Um, then you've got um, hyperthermophiles. They're still thermophilic, but they're the ones there are sometimes called extremophiles. Extremophiles uh, like extreme environmental conditions, like extreme high salt and extreme high acidity or extreme high alkalinity, and there's a group of extremophiles that like extreme high temperatures. And now we're talking uh, out of normal human range of understanding. Again, um, deep sea thermal vents, we'll talk about those again later, but those are uh, in those extreme temperatures. Now, I've left out mesophiles. So the mesophiles are obviously where we are. We are mesophilic. Um, optimally, um, the temperature right in this range, you're looking from maybe about 30 to 40 which um, includes um, body temperatures of all animals. Um, and again, the growth range pretty much from about 20 to maybe 45, as you see there. We'll talk about uh, crossover groups in lecture. OK, pH. Um, there's a pH range over on the right. Uh, remember that these numbers, difference between 1 to 2 and pH of 3 to 4 and pH of 7 to 8 comparison, uh, this is a factor of 10. So a solution of 7 compared to a solution of 8 pH, 10 time difference in pH. 10 times more acidic, pH 7, than 8. Or you could say pH of 8 is 10 times more basic than a pH of 7. Um, most organisms like a 5 to 9 area. Remember, your cells like um, 7. Your blood pH is about 7.4. Um, you've got acidophiles. You've got neutrophiles. You've got alkalinophiles. Most organisms are neutrophilic um, in their pH likes. Uh, there are a lot of bacteria that are acidophilic. Um, you have them in your uh, refrigerator probably right now. They are the ones that are in yogurt. Um, they're the ones that make pickles. Uh, not sweet pickles, but dill and sour, the fermented pickles. Um, they're the ones that are used to um, make cheeses. Those are all acidophilic bacteria. Um, osmotic pressure. So look at the molarity numbers right here. Look at one molar NaCl. That's about 6% NaCl. Um, that's too high for most bacteria, and certainly too high for your cells. Our cells like this area right in here. And in fact, many, many bacteria, and all the bacteria that we're using in lab like that. So the media that we use has a, about Oh, a half percent NaCl, and that's way down over in this area. Look at this blue line. So let's say you're growing E. coli on a plate, um, or on different plates of different concentrations of sodium, uh, of uh, sodium chloride. Um, at uh, the concentration that we have on our media, they grow the best. Again, growth going up on the y-axis. If you keep increasing concentration of NaCl higher than our regular media, you can see that they're not too happy and they stop growing at even less than 1%. So you get down to about 3% and they're very unhappy, E. coli that is. Now, if you're um, growing staph though, look at the yellow line, and here would be staph. Uh, we're going to be using staph quite a bit in lab, and he likes um, 
the same uh, concentrations of NaCl that's in our media, because it's regular media in the lab. But as you can see, he can tolerate these higher concentrations over here. Eventually, he's not too happy. But look at, um, we, we use a media in lab that's about 7.5%, which is over here. So staff will go eh, pretty good at that concentration. Um, staff is called halo tolerant. Halo meaning uh, salt. Tolerant, he can tolerate salt. Then you've got um, halophilic guys. These are the guys that actually need salt. They need high salt to grow, and if you don't give them high salt, they won't grow on media. So those guys will not grow at all on our media. Remember, our media is in this area, and neither the red line, which is a moderate halophile, or extreme uh, halophiles, the extremophiles that like salt, will even grow in our media. We hardly have any lab um, that has these because you have to have very specialized media for them. Um, again, a uh, couple of things we've talked about already. Sugar and salt as preservatives for foods. Okay, let's stop here and then I'll pick up on the second video here.